Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So today I'm going to do the third instalment of this new series that I'm doing uh, entitled Revisiting. So I look at uh, one particular album in each video. Just some old favourites, things that uh, mean a lot to me. And so uh, this instalment we're going to be looking at 10cc, the original soundtrack, released on the 11th of March 1975. And um, this is probably the first rock album I ever heard. Uh, uh, my father was given it as a gift from a work colleague back in 1975 when I was four years old. There was a story about why he gave my dad the album. There was a pencil dedication inside the um, jacket here, uh, which just says, To Bill, from one of your best friends, who is... dot dot dot, 11th of the 10th, 1975. Now, the story of that dedication I've already told in a previous video, so I'll link to that in the video description if you'd like to hear that story. But um, my dad didn't have a lot of uh, pop rock records in the house. He was a classical music fan. This is one of about six popular records he had. And um, one of my earliest memories is of waking up and my parents were having a gathering in the living room, which is next to my room. And uh, the track Blackmail was playing through my dad's reasonably good hi-fi. And um, the slide guitar solo in that song just scared the pants off me. I mean, it's a really scary, strident, shrieking kind of solo from Graham Gouldman. Still sounds scary to this day, you know. Gives me the shivers sometimes to hear it. I'm Not In Love, of course, was the big single from this record. Number one single in the UK. And that's long been a huge favourite of my mum. And, you know, my dad too. And uh, this music goes right back into the mist of time for me. 10CC would be in my top 10 list of artists of all time, really. And, uh, you know, for me, they predate the Beatles, they predate Queen, anything. It was really the first pop rock music I ever heard. So very special to me. This record um, came out in 1975. It was released on the 11th of March, 1975. Got to number three in the charts. Um, it was 10CC's third record made with the still together classic lineup. There they are. Um, so we've got um, Eric Stewart, of course, on vocals and guitar. And um, he was a producer, really, or at least the engineer and the mixer. You've got Graham Gouldman on bass and vocals, Lol Cream on guitar and lots of other instruments and vocals, and Kevin Godley on drums and vocals. And all four of them were songwriters. Really nice picture of them here on the front of this book. This is 10CC. The Worst Band in the World by Liam Newton, which is a great read, essential reading if you want to find out about 10CC. They were from Stockport. They'd come together really as a kind of studio outfit in order to back up other artists. They had their own studio in Stockport called Strawberry. And they'd done work with Neil Sedaka and various other people. Got signed to Jonathan King's label, uh, UK, in the UK. And they scored big with their first single, Donna, of course, the first 10CC album, the second 10CC album, which I think is known as their masterpiece. That was Sheet Music. And this was the third one that came out after that. And um, the band had just left Jonathan King's label and had signed um, to Mercury. There was a bit of a hoo-ha. They were meant to be signing to Virgin and things got a bit messy. And um, I won't go into all the details now, but essentially they moved to Mercury. So this record is on the is on the Mercury label. So um, just a quick word about the cover art before we get into the music. Um, incredible picture. This is actually a drawing, a pencil drawing. Wonderful level of detail. It was done by an artist by the name of Humphrey Ocean. And this was the photograph that he based the drawing on. Um, so you can see here some vintage old movie gear. And uh, he basically redrew that picture, turned it into a pencil drawing. Originally, it was meant to be there was meant to be a, a a hole there for the picture of the band, which is on the inside gatefold, to peep through. But for, but for some reason, they decided not to go with that. Um, so yeah, that's the in in a gatefold for the third time of the band uh, there in the window, and we have uh, lyric sheets. And have a quick look at the label. Let's have a look. It's just on the blue, lovely blue Mercury label. There it is. So this was a big album, really. Um, it was the first time that 10CC had written a load of songs in advance. They had this very unusual songwriting uh, arrangement whereby they would write a song and then they would 
arrange it and record it and finish it before they started to write another song, which is not something that other bands have done really. But for this album, I think because there'd been some ups and downs happening legally with the deal they were trying to get with Virgin and then it ended up being Mercury, uh, they ended up writing a bunch of songs. So um, when they started to record this album, they kind of had a lot of stuff mapped out. And I think this is the first album where the songwriting, the two songwriting duos in the band properly started to cross fertilize because you'd always had Godley and Cream, obviously, Kevin Godley and Lord Cream writing together. And they were the more arty, weird pair, much more avant garde. They were the ones who would come up with the oddball, strange, eccentric ideas. And then on the other side of the fence, you had Eric Stewart and Graham Gouldman, and they were the pop guys, really. They were the McCartney-esque pop songwriters, very commercial. But on this record, they started to chop and change things around a little bit. You've got this song, The Second Sitting for the Last Supper, which is actually credited to all four of them, so that was a bit of a turnout for the books. Life in a Minestrone, which was the first single from the record, and I think it was a top ten hit. Uh, that was Lord Cream and Eric Stewart, so again, that was a new partnership. There was a bit of a mishmash going on. They were trying some new ideas. They were trying, I think, to extend or to evolve their songwriting partnerships within the band. So, in retrospect, I don't think 10CC uh, were particularly pleased 100% with this record. I think they still think, looking back, that sheet music was their magnum opus, and I would probably agree with that. It's got a a great deal of consistency to that record, a lot of really great writing. This album is slightly more checkered when viewed objectively, but I still absolutely love it. Like I said, I mean, it, it's it's just in my blood, you know. Um, gets off to a fantastic start, side one with Unuita Pali, which is a kind of rock opera, really. Originally, it was, it was about 20 minutes long. It was meant to be a full side of the record, but then um, I think Gilman and Stewart said to Godley and Cream, I think we should hack it down a bit. There was a whole section which they didn't like, which so they hacked it down to eight minutes, but it's still a magnum opus. I think it predated Bohemian Rhapsody, but it's the story of a murder in Paris, essentially. And um, I love the way it starts. It kind of opens the album with these sound effects of a Parisian morning. So you hear the bicycle um, horns going off and um, shop vendors opening their hatchways. And I noticed this time listening to it, there's a, <laughs> there's a Caribbean band playing in the street, which is a nice touch, which I'd never particularly clocked before. It's classic kind of George Martin, Beatles territory. 10CC, I think, were the band that carried on the Beatles mantle maybe more than any other, just in terms of being great um, sound manipulators and just with a great subversive sense of humour, really. So One Night in Paris tells the story of a murder in Paris. It goes through all these different movements and they sing in French accents in it. Um, Kevin Godley has gone on record since saying he wishes they hadn't done that. He thinks it's the one thing that makes the song a bit kind of cheesy, but I disagree. I think the French accents work really well. There are some sublime moments in the piece. Uh, it, it goes through lots of different parts and it's, it's really well put together. And amazingly, they used to play it live, which is a fairly astonishing thing to hear. I mean, they're extremely accomplished musicians, obviously. Then you've got I'm Not In Love, which, I mean, that's a whole video in itself, really. Incredibly innovative song, which was recorded using voices and um, acres and acres of, of tape loops. The band had to record themselves singing every note in the chromatic scale and then build loops out of it. And um, originally it was meant to be done just like that with voices, but then they did a guide track with Eric Stewart on um, electric keyboard and they had um, Kevin Godley playing a synthesized drum uh, part, just a bass drum, kind of like a bossa nova feel. Originally the song had been a bossa nova song, but they pulled back on that and they turned it into one of these great soft rock epics from the 1970s. Um, I just love it. I think it's an absolute masterpiece. The wonderful bit in the middle of the song where the where the girl comes in saying, "Big boys don't cry," and of course the story behind that was that it was it was uh, it was Ten CC secretary who they press ganged into doing that for them. And um, if you listen closely to the fade out at the end of "I'm Not in Love," you'll hear a a toy music box which Law Cream uh, had bought, and um, he swung it over his head in the studio, and they recorded it. You can just hear this kind of ghostly kind of sound in the background, really clever. The lyric obviously is is just absolutely sublime. This idea of the guy telling himself that he's not in love, but of course he is, and he hides the girl's picture on the wall to cover a nasty stain that's lying there. I mean, it's just absolutely epic. Um, so yeah, just one of the great all-time British hit singles. Got to number one, of course, in 1975. 
Then you've got Blackmail, the third song, which is again a wonderful song. It's the one I mentioned earlier with the slide guitar solo. This is a song about a guy who basically tries to blackmail this girl by taking some uh, some rude, lewd pictures of her, but they end up um, getting used in various uh, fashion magazine centerfolds, and she ends up being a superstar. It's a great song, great sense of humour to it. Love it. So side one is pretty much faultless, and... Um, Side two, I think, is weaker. There's some good moments on it, but perhaps not. it's not quite as strong. The first song, The Second Sitting for the Last Supper, has got some really funny lyrics. Essentially, it's a song about um, Jesus Christ, you know, being late uh, on his uh, messianic return, really, in the way that the world's going to hell in a handcart while we're still waiting for him to come. It's more like a kind of heavy metal song, really. It's 10cc trying to show they could be a bit of a rocking heavy band. It's a really good song, actually. I do, I do like it. It's grown over me over the years. It's grown over me. It's grown on me over the years. The second track, uh, Brand New Day, um, Lord Cream co-wrote that one, and it was inspired by the birth of his son. He just uh, had a son with his wife, who they call Lalo. And um, it's a very twinkly song, very beautiful. But again, it's got that kind of dark element to it in the song he sings about things not being so great with the world, you know. And essentially, it's a song about really a father's anxiety, I suppose, about bringing a child into the world when there's so many things that could happen to that child. And um, it's a wonderful production, very soft and beautiful and pretty. Um, I don't think it's necessarily all that memorable. It's quite nice to listen to when it's on, but it doesn't particularly stick with me. And um, the same would go for Flying Junk, really, which is, um, that's a song about a drug dealer. It's got a really clever little riff in it. Uh, it's a guitar riff, and it's, that actually is very memorable. But the song itself I don't find particularly memorable. It's not bad, it's okay. Um, I don't think it's up there with anything on side one. Then things pick up, though. The last two tracks I absolutely love. Life in a Minestrone is just a very uh, infectious, upbeat, happy kind of pop song with a, a surreal lyric. Um, it's very silly, it's very comedic, but it works really well. Really, really infectious. And uh, that, that was the first single from the album, interestingly. They went for that one first, rather than I'm Not In Love, maybe because they thought it was a more conventional pop song. I like it, it's good. And the final song, The Film of My Love, is just wonderful. I don't think the band themselves are particularly keen on it now. I think they saw it as being a bit too kitsch, really. But it's, it's, it's Graham Gouldman singing this very, very corny, over-the-top um, love ballad. And he weaves in all these um, titles of songs into the lyric. And the idea is that it's the film of his love. He's going to travel the world forever. He's going he's to film his girlfriend and... He, you know, he's going to do all these things. It's incredibly cheesy. It's got a mandolin part in it, played by Lord Cream, and it breaks down into this instrumental interlude halfway through that always makes me laugh because it's just it just sounds so clunky. There's a kind of drum machine in it playing this really clunky loop, and there's all these nice exotic instruments over the top. And Graham Gouldman's performance is just absolutely fantastic. So, um, and that kind of fades off into the distance, and that's the last song. So. I think side two starts well, dips a bit in the middle, and then ends on a real high. I, I, but I still do think that side one is the piece de resistance on this record. And if you wanted to play somebody a side of a record by Tim C, I would say you know go for go for side one of the original soundtrack. I think for me it's up there with uh, with what's on sheet music. Um, so it was a hit album. Um, let me sh read out a couple of reviews for you from this book. Um, so. 10CC's original soundtrack is a fascinating record, according to Ken Barnes in Rolling Stone. Musically, there's more going on than in 10 Yes albums, yet it's generally as accessible as a straight pop band. 10CC is among the few groups actively engaged in stretching rock's restrictive boundaries in a constructive and meaningful manner without falling prey to pretense or excess. And that's an interesting point, I think. I mean, 10CC were never a prog band, but they had easily as many ideas as the next prog band on the block. But they did it in a way that was more art pop than prog rock. And I think that was them coming out of the Beatles. And that John Lennon humour, which really goes back to the goons, I suppose. Phonograph Records wrote of their powerful melodies, perfect vocals and lyrics that are masterpieces in their own right. And... Um, yeah, it was it was a really big album for them. Just seeing here, Wayne Coyne of the Flaming Lips and Mike Mills of REM um, have come out saying that they absolutely love um, the original soundtrack, particularly I'm, I'm Not In Love. It was such a studio innovation, I think. Nobody had ever heard anything like it, and it's just gone on to influence so many things. 
So yeah, I think in retrospect, Tennessee C, the original soundtrack, I'd give it a good 8 out of 10. I think it's a classic 1970s. Um, I think it would do it a disservice to call it a soft rock record. I think there's more to it than that. But certainly one of the most important records in my musical evolution of my life, and one which is very dear to me. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll be back soon for another episode in the series of Revisiting. Stay tuned. Take care. Bye.